Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly at 11 a.m. For those of you who are here early, thank you for waiting patiently. While you're waiting, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on a bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the League of Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice, while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website. And we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk entitled Bills and Administration of Estates. My name is Su An. I'm an associate with Maoing Gua and Associates, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's session, allow me to introduce the firm and what we do. Maoing Gua and Associates is a mid sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Datuk Ma Wing Our ABLE team today comprises of 22 lawyers and a support team of 19. Datuk Ma is a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small medium enterprises, family businesses, and individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department, a dispute resolution department, including litigation, adjudication, and arbitration, a dedicated employment industrial relations team, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice groups indicate some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk is part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. But with the COVID-19 movement control order, or MCO, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, and in-house counsels. This is the ninth talk in our MWK online talk series, which has been attended by some 1,869 attendees. Today, we're expecting 205 people who have registered. Please visit our website at maoingkwai.com for more information to read our articles and to sign up for more upcoming talks. Now, allow me to introduce both our speakers for today. Our first speaker is Priscilla Chong, an associate in our dispute resolution department. She holds a Bachelor of Laws from Cardiff University and was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2017. 
Our second speaker is one of our firm's partner, Gan Xiong Che. He graduated from the University of London with a Bachelor of Law and has also obtained a Master of Law in International Economic Law from East China University of Political Science and Law. Gan was called to the Malaysian Bar in 2009. Our speakers hope to complete today's talk by 11.45 a.m. and thereafter proceed with the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please don't forget to post them up on Slido and our speakers will address them later. You should have received a link to Slido during registration, but I will leave this slide up for a while so that you can scan the QR code before we move on. Alternatively, you can go to Slido's webpage and key in the code 76111. Now, we all know that with a will, you can distribute your assets according to your wishes. This helps to protect the interests of your loved ones because having a will means that you, rather than your country's law, decide who inherits your assets. Unfortunately, many delay this important task until it is too late. This has resulted in disputes among family members and prolonged delay in the administration of the estates. For today's session, Priscilla will first discuss the importance of having a will and the formalities of a valid will. She will also address common misconceptions surrounding the will making process. Later, Gan will discuss the necessary steps to administer an estate via a grant of probate and a grant of letters of administration. We will also introduce our firm's new project where we will share on how you can have your wills prepared online. With that said, I will now invite Priscilla to share her insights on the will making process. Over to you, Priscilla. Thank you, Suen. Hi, everyone. I'm Priscilla. Thank you for joining us this morning and starting your week with our MWKA online series. Today, I'll be sharing my insights on will writing um, with you. To many, many, to many, will writing is a very daunting process and some might even consider it as a taboo. However, with my insights today, I hope that um, you have a better understanding on the will writing process and the process will be um, less daunting to you. So before I go into my first top point on the importance and benefits of having a will, let's look at the definition of a will. So a will, the definition of a will is stated in Section 2.1 of the Wills Act 1959. It is a declaration intended to have legal effects of the intention of the testator with respect to his property or other matters which desires to be carried into effect after his death. So basically, what does this mean? A will is, in brief, a document where you can record your wishes and intentions um, in relation to the manner of distribution. You can also list down your wishes and bequests which you want um, to be carried out after your death. So we now move on to my first top point, which is the importance and benefits of having a will. There are many importance and there are many benefits of having a will. However, I've listed the major five, which I think is important. Firstly, you can choose to leave your assets to your intended beneficiaries. You can choose your executor. I've always advised my client that um, it's important that an executor must be someone that you can trust because he or she will be carrying out your wishes and administering your estate. You can also choose a guardian for your children and provide for them. You can create a testamentary trust in your will. You can also revoke your will anytime if it does not uh, represent your interest anymore. So moving on to formalities and contents of a will, the basic formalities of a will is that the maker of the will must be of sound mind with animus ascendi, which is the intention to make a will. This is provided in Section 3 of the Wills Act. The maker of the will must be 18 years old and above, and no will shall be valid in writing and executed in the manner prescribed in Section 5 of the Wills Act. So what goes in the contents of a will? Firstly, you must include the particulars of the testator. You need to write the name clearly with the IC and the address. You will also need to list down the appointment of executors, the contents where you will state your intention, declaration and wishes, beneficiaries, details, the date, and the signatures of the maker of the will, testator, and two witnesses. So, if you recall earlier that I mentioned that the appointment of executor is a very important one, 
So who is an executor? An executor is the person appointed to administer the estate of the testator to carry out the wishes or requests of the testator. An executor must be willing and capable of acting. So what does this mean? We have encountered scenarios where um, executors come to us and they inform us that they are unable and incapable of acting um, as an executor. So I've always advised my clients that before you commence with your real writing process, perhaps you can confirm with um, the individual whom you would like to appoint as executor to inform him that um, to inform him on whether he is uh, willing and capable of doing so. An executor may also be appointed from the pool of beneficiaries. The appointment of alternative executors can also be stated in the will. This is a good practice because um, if you state an alternative executor in your will, you can prevent situations where your executors has predeceased you so that you don't have to rewrite your will again. The Probate and Administration Act 1959 provides that you can appoint a maximum of four persons um, as executors. So they will all be co-executors and they will be jointly administering your estate. If there is a beneficiary who is an infant or a life interest arises under a will, administration shall be granted to a trust corporation or no less than two individuals. If you have an infant, it's always advisable that you include two executors so that you do not have to include a trust corporation later on. Moving on to what can be disposed of by a will. Section three of the Wills Act provides that property or an interest in a property belonging to the testator to be received by the testator can be disposed of by a will. So I've listed five here. The first one is personal or movable property. This will include um, monies in your bank account, jewelry, um, cars. So the second one is real and um, immobile property. This will include land uh, or houses that you have, shareholding and company, partnership interests, interest given under the will of another individual. However, this is provided that the gift has not lapsed. So what can you not dispose of by a will? We have um, leads coming in asking us on whether um, they can include their EPF funds or insurance policy under the will. If you have nominations under the EPF and insurance policy, payouts from the insurance policies and EPF will not form part of your estate or used to be paid your debts. In the federal case of Hall Yu Hock, executor of the estate of Yu So Tong disease, um, the federal court has held that statutory nominations will prevail over will. In this case, um, the appellant actually applied for a declaration to declare the deceased um, nomination in the EPF is now and void, and um, her wishes in the will should be respected. However, the federal court has held that statutory nominations will prevail over will. The relevant provision for insurance policies is Section um, 130 of the Financial Services Act um, 2013. My next um, topic is on conditional gifts. Testator can impose condition precedence in the will. What is a condition precedent? Condition precedent basically means that the testator can um, impose certain conditions before the beneficiary um, can acquire an interest in the gift. However, these conditions can be um, impossible to perform. If you see here on the slides, I've listed examples. So the first one is the conditions can be impossible to perform. For example, to purchase property or build a house during war. It's basically impossible for your beneficiary to do so. Therefore, um, such conditions are not valid. The, the other conditions are such as um, it cannot be against the public policy. It cannot be too vague or uncertain because um, your executor will have problems when he or she um, distributes the asset later on. It definitely, can, um, it definitely cannot be illegal. So you can't ask your beneficiary to commit a crime or any act prohibited by the law before he or she can acquire an interest 
the condition can also not be in conflict with the interests of the beneficiaries or in conflict with the gifts and provisions of the will. One of the benefits um, of having a will is you can create testamentary trust. A testamentary trust is created under the will and will take effect upon the death of the testator. It is usually created to provide for the manner of distribution or part of the estate. There can be more than one testamentary trust per will, depending on the testator's wishes. In general, there are two types of testamentary trust, fixed testamentary trust and discretionary testamentary trust. The benefits of having testamentary trust in your wills is um, such as it will help preserve your assets, your trustee will retain discretion in handling the assets. So your trustee will have discretion on how um, the benefits should be given out or distributed to your beneficiaries. So that being said, your, there is a form of discretion by the trustees in handling the assets. It also prevents um, dissipation of assets prematurely. There might be assets you wish to keep and generate income for your beneficiaries. You do not want your beneficiaries to sell them off too prematurely. So you can include these assets in testamentary trust in a will. It's also ideal if uh, you have beneficiaries who are unable to handle a lump sum benefit responsibly. So your trustee can um, have control over the assets. Therefore, your beneficiaries will not be able to sell them off too prematurely. My colleague and I has actually uh, written an article on this, um, the frequently asked questions on condition precedence and testamentary trust. A link to the article will be posted in the chat box if you'd like to have more information on that. Moving on to the next topic, which is residuary clause. This is one of the most important clauses in a will because I look at it as a catch-all provision. Residuary clause is um, basically comprises everything that is left in the estate after all that and administration expenses have been paid off, all specific and non-specific gifts that have been disposed. If you do not have a residuary clause in your will, your assets or properties not stated in the will may fall under the ambit of the Distribution Act. And this is what we call partial intestacy. Therefore, having a residuary clause in your will is important so that you prevent your assets from going into intestacy and you will not be able to distribute or give um, those gifts or assets um, to your intended beneficiaries. I now move on to beneficiaries. So who is a beneficiary? Beneficiary is basically individuals with capacity to benefit. You can give it to uh, whoever you want to However, um, there are examples of individuals who have no capacity to benefit. Firstly, th these are individuals who predecease the testator. If someone has predeceased you, he or she will not be able to inherit your property. Secondly, it is the attesting witnesses. When you execute a will, you will have two witnesses um, attesting to it. So these witnesses cannot be your beneficiaries as well as there will be a conflict of interest. Lastly, the husband and wife of the attesting witnesses cannot benefit from your estate as well. The gift under such clauses will be utterly null and void. This is provided under Section 9 of the Wills Act. For the mode of execution of a will, it can be found in Section 5 of the Wills Act 1959. The signature of the testator is to be at the foot of and of the end of uh, the will, the signature of the testator must be in presence of two witnesses, as I mentioned earlier. Both of these witnesses must sign after the signature of the testator. And these witnesses must also be present at the same time, witnessing the executor executing his will. Because later on, um, these witnesses will need to affirm an affidavit, verifying that they have indeed um, witness the signature of the testator. My last top point will be on addressing common misconceptions. I understand that there have been various misconceptions uh, when it comes to will writing. A will will only come into effect upon the death of a testator. So there have been people that came to us and asked, um, 
whether their properties will be transferred after the will has been signed. However, a will will only come upon, into effect upon the death of the testator. So you will still have interest in your property and assets until um, you pass away. A will do not need to be stamped to be valid. A will basically um, only needs to be witnessed by two witnesses. You can amend your will by making fresh a fresh will or by way of a codicil. There is, um, it is not a compulsory requirement for the maker of the will to initial at every page, but it's a good practice to follow. And lastly, everyone can make a will, except for infants. This is provided under Section 4 of the Wills Act. And with that, I conclude my presentation and I will hand over the floor to Gan. My partner Gan will be explaining more on the administration of estates. Thank you. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to attend today's talk. I will continue with the talk on the administration of estates. And just a brief note, uh, the Wills Act 1955 only applies to non-Muslim. Uh, this is a very uh, important note. Um, if there are any uh, Muslim uh, attendees um, listening to today's talk, uh, they have to bear in mind that um, the discussion here today or the sharing here today only involve uh, wills for non-Muslim. So hopefully with my brief sharing today on um, the administration of estates, the attendees today get to take away some uh, salient points of concepts of what happens after the passing of the testator or even your loved ones. So before we get into the nitty gritties of administration of estate or what we should do, we have to know what are the applicable laws uh, in Malaysia. So we have to differentiate between the West Malaysia, Sarawak and Sabah. So the Wills Act of 1959 applies in West Malaysia and also Sarawak, but the Sabah uh, has its own uh, Sabah will ordinance. If it falls under intestacy, so the West Malaysia, we have the Distribution Act, and Sarawak, we also apply the Distribution Act of 1958. But in Sabah, we have the Intestate Succession Ordinance of 1960. If a testator passed away with a will, so in West Malaysia, we have the Probate and Administration Act of 1959. However, for Sarawak and Sabah, they have their own set of laws, whereby for Sarawak is the Administration of Estates Ordinance, and for Sabah, we have the Probate and Administration Ordinance. So today's talk, my focus will mainly, or primar primarily on the Distribution Act of 1958 and the Probate and Administration Act of 1959. I wouldn't touch uh, anything on Sarawak and Sabah. So what's the difference between the grant of probate and grant of letters of administration? I know many people, they pull their hairs to think, what should I do next? Or, whether do I apply for a grant of probate or do I apply for a grant of letters of administration? So uh, this chart will show you uh, in G's what someone will do. So if you have a will, then naturally you go for a grant of probate. So if a testator or someone passes away without a will, so um, the person interested here or the beneficiaries or anyone with interest in the estate, they will apply for something known as the grant of letters of administration. So again, also you go to the high court, you have to give in an administration bond because the court will not know who are the uh, interested person. So in order to safeguard the estate, uh, administration bond are usually required by the high court. So, and then upon the payment of the administration bond, you be given a grant of letters of administration. And subsequently, because it falls under the letters of administration, then you have to get a distribution order. And the distribution order is a separate order altogether, a separate application altogether. And even if, let's say, there's an administration bond, um, the administration bond can be dispensed uh, by putting in an application. So now, we thought if, we pass, if someone passes away with a, a will, it's known as testacy. If someone passes with, away without a will, it's known as intestacy. So let me get into the definition. An individual who passed away with a valid will is known as testacy. The will only takes effect upon the death of the testator. So the executor appointed in the will will make an application known as the grant of probate at the high court. So what do you actually file in the high court? The originating summons plus the affidavit in support. You also have to file in something known as the notice of appointment of solicitors to tell the court that you have appointed so-and-so to be your solicitors in making this application. And also you need to file in the affidavits of the witnesses. So 
if you still remember uh, Priscilla's uh, talk earlier on, at the foot of the wheel, you need to have two witnesses. So uh, you have to put in um, the affidavit of these two witnesses. So questions that can come will be, what happens if one pass away and cannot be found? So you can still pull in uh, one affidavit uh, of that the very particular witness that you can still find and the court will also still grant you the uh, grant of probate. So next, we get into intestacy. So what is intestacy? Intestacy, like I, what I've explained, a death of a person without a will. So all persons interested in the estate, and here you can see it's uh, highlighted, uh, usually beneficiary, beneficiaries can make an application for grant of letters of administration at the High Court. Again, same, you have to put in the auditing summons plus an affidavit in support and also the notice of appointment of solicitors. You also have to put in a letter of consent or renunciation. Basically, um, the consent of all other beneficiaries to tell the court that I have no issue with so-and-so taking up the letters of administration. Then also you have to put in an administration oath basically an oath to say that you will uh, administer the estate uh, faithfully and without any um, fraud and stuff. And like what I mentioned earlier on, that you can apply for an application to dispense the administration bond. So if the estate is less than 50K, you do not need, or the court will most likely won't ask you to put in the administration bond. But if it's more than 50K and the court asks you to actually put in the administration bond, you can actually put in an application to dispense the administration bond. And next, you have to go through the distribution order um, for or order for sale for immovable properties. Next, who are the beneficiaries? So section six of the Distribution Act of 1958 sets out the persons entitled to the estate and the manner of distribution. So who are the persons under section six? So you have spouse, you have children, you have parents, and spouse, children, parents are usually the, the, main, uh, the, main, the main people. And you have siblings, grandparents, uncle, aunts, great grandparents, great grand uncles, and great grand aunts. And lastly, the bona vacantia. So usually that is how the, the, the order will go. So let's say uh, if there's no spouse, no children, no parents, then it will go to siblings. Then subsequently with grandparents, uncles, great grandparents, great grand uncles. And lastly, there's no one else, then bona vacantia here means back to the government. So this table will show you a brief description on the, the three main people, the spouse, parents, and children. So, so let's say there's, there are no parents, no children, then the whole estate will go to the spouse. If there is no children, but there's spouse and parents, so half, half each. So if there's no spouse, no parents, then the children will get the whole estate. If there's no parents, the spouse and children, the children will get two thirds, the spouse will get one third. So likely if no spouse, the parents will get one third, the children will get two thirds. If there's spouse, there's parents, there's children, the children get half, the parents and the spouse get quarter. Similarly, if there is no children, no spouse, then the parents get the whole estate. If you can see from this table, the children will usually get more. So let's say if there are uh, three children, so half, they will be shared equally to all the other children. So next, remuneration. Uh, we know that um, executors sometimes they have to run, run around to actually administer the estate. So, but then there are no provisions in the will or terms in the will that allow the executors to actually basically get paid. So under section 43 sub 1 of the Probate Administration Act, the court may allow the executors or administrators a commission not exceeding 5% on the value of assets collected. So let's say if there's no uh, provision for any uh, fees, the executor or the administrators can actually make an application to court and to seek the court's indulgence in allowing them to basically get a percentage for being their fee of running around and administering the estate. Next, we will talk about possible complications. So what are the possible complications that an executor may face or even an administrator of estate may face? So for example, if there's a will, the executor may expressly renounce his or her rights to the representation. So that's section eight. Um, a constructive renunciation happens when uh, a citation has been issued and the executor or the administrator uh, couldn't attend court. So technically they have renounced their right to actually uh, take up the grant of representation. So if the person has renounced from applying uh, 
precluded from applying a representation representation thereafter. Meaning, if they have already renounced their rights, then they are unlikely to actually apply again. Caveat. So, and we have to distinguish. This is not the the land caveat that uh, most people uh, may know of. Here, the caveat is to caveat the estate or to prevent that a uh, grant of representation is not being made to that person. So a caveat can be entered at the High Court Registry. And, and you can realize here it's the High Court Registry and not at the land office. So basically to caveat, yes, the, the representation not being given out. And the caveat is valid for six months and the procedure for caveat is provided for under Order 71 of the Rules of Court. What are the possible challenges that um, a testator may face or or, or the estate we face. So here we can have the lack of testamentary capacity, basically not of sound mind, memory, understanding, suspicious circumstances, undue influence, forgery, fraud, and also uh, the beneficiaries may actually apply to remove the executor. So what is basically lack of testamentary? So, so basically um, the person that is alleging that the testator is lack, lack the testamentary capacity then they have the burden of proving that the testator lacks the so-called testamentary capacity. So how to prove a testamentary capacity? In Udam Singh against uh, Indakor or even in the case of Yu Bunya, the contents of the will was read and the testator understood the contents, the effect and the extent of the disposal of the property. So if let's say the testator didn't know all this, so of course you need to show evidence to, sh to show that the testator understood everything. If you can show that the testator didn't understand any of all this, then that shows that there is a lack of testamentary capacity. So how do you show that the testator lacks the testamentary capacity? You have to produce medical report. Medical report to show that the testator suffered unsoundness of mind or lacked the mental capacity to make a will. And mere bodily ill health of imperfect memory is insufficient to prove testamentary capacity. So just because I am for example, I have cancer. That doesn't mean that I couldn't do a will. It, as long as it doesn't affect my mind, the will is still valid. Next on suspicious circumstances. So the burden again on proving uh, suspicious circumstances falls on the person that actually alleges it. So what are the examples of suspicious circumstances? So let's say there's a substantial gift to a person who prepared or was closely involved in the preparation of the will. One method of dispelling suspicious circumstances is to show that the testator obtained independent legal advice. And hence, why it's important to actually get your trusted legal uh, lawyers, which is us, to actually help you in the, prep in the preparation of the will. And I think why it's important is because um, there are cases to show that um, when the testator actually uh, seek out uh, legal advice, it could show that they, they know what they are doing. Hence, uh, the court is likely to let the will go through. Again, undue influence, uh, the person alleging undue influence bears the burden of proving. So, if the testator was coerced into executing the will in the form that he has taken, or the will was not the voluntary act of the testator, then there is undue influence. And this has been uh, decided in the case of Carmel Mary suicide. Also, fraud, uh, forgery and fraud. Again, a person alleged forgery bears the burden of proving. What are the uh, situations where there's forgery or fraud? So the testator's signature on the will does not bear the true and genuine signature. The, and the allegation of forgery is the most common race in, in situations where there are two wills in existence. So how do you prove a wish will or how do you prove fraud? So the evidence of handwriting expert to prove signature does not belong to the testator. So you need to get a handwriting expert to come in. And, but there are, there's, there are cases uh, which has been decided by uh, Kopal Sri Ram, which says that uh, even if you can get the handwriting expert to show that the signature has been forged, but if the witnesses that actually uh, attested to the signing, theirs are considered to be a direct evidence and the courts are likely to accept uh, the direct evidence rather the evidence of the handwriting expert. So removal of executor, these are the possible challenges. So for example, let's say um, I'm the executor and I've not been doing my job well. So the beneficiaries may actually launch an attack on me and ask me to be removed from my office as an executor. 
The court is empowered to remove an executor or trustee where there is a failure to act because of unfitness or incapacity to act. And the consideration here is usually the interests and beneficiaries of the estate. So if it can be shown to the court that the interest of the beneficiaries has, been, has not been protected or the estate come into maybe disrepute or whatever, then uh, the likelihood of the uh, executor being removed is very high. There are no direct provisions for removal of uh, executor in the Probate and Administration Act, and the closest will be Section 40 of the Probate and Administration Act, 1959. And Section 34 of the Probate and Administration Act, 1959, provides that any probate or letters of administration may be revoked or amended for any sufficient cause. So there is no, um, there's no one size or definition of what is sufficient cause. And usually the sufficient cause here will be, again, uh, the interests of the beneficiaries and also to protect the uh, estate. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the link to sufficient cause. So what are the usual examples of sufficient cause to actually remove an executor? A failure to render accounts, a failure to administer the estate, a failure to call in the assets or intermeddle with the assets, uh, active hostility towards the beneficiary. These are uh, examples. Of course, there are more. However, cases have shown that court is slow in removing the person named in the will ex executor. And in the case of Leong Xiao King against Ho Sun Cheng, and this was a case that was handled by uh, the firm, whereby the uh, beneficiaries uh, actually made an application to the court to remove uh, our client uh, as an executor. But the, uh, among other, there are other prayers too. Um, so what the court held was um, because uh, the executor was named in the will, hence the testator actually trusted the, the executor, hence um, there is no reason to, to remove the executor and, and the beneficiaries failed to show any that the executor didn't act accordingly. All right, so we have come to the end of, our, of my presentation and MWK has recently launched a personalized will writing package online. We are offering three different packages. Uh, we have the essential, intermediate, and comprehensive uh, package. But uh, this is by no means uh, an, automate, an automated uh, online process. So basically, you still, uh, for any um, inquiries or anyone interested in um, these will writing packages, so you have to fill out a form online and our lawyers will keep in, uh, get in touch with you and to discuss with you on how to actually uh, draft your will and to take your instructions. And since the MCO is now uh, enforced, so um, we will still um, liaise with you and tell you or inform you on how or advise you on the signing process. Next, we will go into the questions. And, and we'll take questions from uh, the attendees and I'll hand this back to the moderator, Sue Ann. Thank you, Gan. Uh, thank you, Priscilla. Thank you for sharing with us. We will now take questions that some of you have posted on Slido. Our first question for today, how long is the process to obtain grant of letters of administration? Priscilla? Priscilla, how long is the process to obtain grant of letters of administration? Thank you, Sue Ann. Um, how long is the process to obtain a grant of letters of administration? It generally now takes only three months with the e-filing system and um, all the other technology in place. So it is not, um, it does not take years as it used to be now. I see. Our uh, next question. Can a Singapore will be used in Malaysia? How much will it cost if a Singapore will can't be used in Malaysia? Gan? Yes, uh, thank you, Suen. Um, Yes, a uh, Singapore will can be used in Malaysia. Uh, so even if you have uh, drafted the will, um, even not say Singapore, even in Australia, you can still have it used in Malaysia to apply to probate. But I think the main point here is to, to know whether where the uh, testator actually domiciled. So if let's say, uh, even if the testator has assets in Malaysia and he's actually a Singaporean citizen, so even if you have a will in Singapore, you have to take that will to the Singapore courts to apply for probate and then subsequently have it um, resealed in Malaysia. And I hope that um, answered the question. I see. 
So our participants, remember you can ask us questions on Slido either by scanning this QR code or going to Slido's webpage and key in the code 76111. Okay, our next question. What is the best way in dealing with assets which are owned jointly by a married couple in their wills? Priscilla, uh, what do you think? So when I think this... Um is very much a subjective question because you can deal with your assets however you like to. So I actually don't have an answer for that. It really depends on um, the couple themselves. I see. Can a trust be set up inside a will? Example, executor is to hold the assets and thereafter devolve unto the beneficiaries upon the executor's demise. Gan, what are your thoughts? Um, yes, a uh, trust can be set up inside a will. But however, I will, um, I, I, I do not agree or I would refrain from um, getting the executor to hold the assets and only uh, pass it on upon his demise because then the executor is no longer there to actually uh, help to actually uh, transfer the assets. So perhaps uh, it will be a, a better uh, way is to set a timeline as to when the assets uh, have to be given to the beneficiaries. I see. Thank you, Gan, for that. Um, Priscilla, on what basis can a letter of administration be challenged? I think an, I mean, a letter of administration can be challenged if it has been firstly um, granted without a valid ground. So perhaps um, the beneficiaries later found that there is a will. So you can definitely challenge the letters of administration if uh, a will has been found. So uh, if the, the, the main point is that it shouldn't have been granted in the first place? Right. If it is granted in the first place, then um, it forms a basis to challenge the letters of administration. Okay. Yeah, just, just to add on, um, the basis could be of many, uh, many facets. There's no one single basis right. to actually challenge a letter of administration. Yeah, um, it depends on your scenario actually. Yes, exactly. So um, you can't just, there's no one, one size fit all kind of uh, basis to, to challenge the letter of administration. I see. Okay, our next question. Can real estate in, in real be subject to condition i.e. sale restricted to siblings and not to exit 50% of market value at time of sale. Gan, what are your thoughts? Uh, yes, um, the real estate in will can be subject to condition, but I think the ultimately, uh, I, I guess, what is the whole purpose? And, and let's say even after the sale to the siblings, so what happens to the proceeds? So does it go back to the estate or how is it to be distributed? Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, the whole intention of the will is to know where the assets go to, who are the beneficiaries. So it, if this condition is for the sale, uh, restricted to savings, yes, but uh, what happens to the money that, that upon the sales, to whom it goes to, I think um, we have to address that, uh, that, that issue then. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to our next question. Can a non-Muslim testator Bequeath a gift or legacy to a Muslim nephew, an offspring of the testator's brother who converted to Islam marrying a Muslim wife. Um, Priscilla, perhaps you can take this question? Yes, um, a non-Muslim can give his or her assets to a Muslim, definitely. Um, but it doesn't work the other way around, uh, as far as I know. So my answer to that is yes a non-Muslim testator can bequeath a gift to a Muslim nephew. I have been informed that a citation will be served, but what is the function of this citation? Uh, Gan, perhaps you can explain this? All right, a citation, um, there are a few types of citation. Um, the usual one is, let's say there's a will, and the executor, after for a very long time, refused to act. So um, the beneficiaries can actually uh, put in a citation to court, to basically uh, inform uh, the executor to actually come forward to accept or refuse to take the grant. Um, that's one of the citations. The other citation could also be a situation where a grant has already been issued, correct? A grant has already been issued, but then they realize the will perhaps uh, is, uh, is forged. So uh, a citation can be issued uh, where 
the court then will require the executor who has taken out the probate to actually return uh, the grant uh, pending the uh, pending the settlement of the uh, dispute between the parties. So technically, what what is a type citation? As a, exactly, a citation is basically like a formal notice to court to tell you that uh, something needs to be done. Uh, please come to court and see whether can you uh, do that certain function. I see. Can they ignore this citation? No, because if you ignore the citation, then let's say for example, if you if the citation is to call you to court to actually to accept or refuse the probate and you refuse to attend or ignore the whole citation, then technically you are like what I mentioned just now, you have expressly renounced or constructive renunciation that uh, you no longer want to take up the uh, probate anymore. I see. Thank you for that, Gan. Uh, next question. Any limit to children's age? If they are below 18, can they get it, Priscilla? All right. Um, there is no limitation on the children's age. You can still give um, any, your assets to your children if they are below 18. However, if um, you pass away before they turn 18, the assets will be held by the executor on trust um, for the benefit of your children. So you can include them. Correct. And just to add to uh, Priscilla's uh, comments, if let's say there is a will, uh, usually you have to nominate two executors instead of one uh, if, the, if there is a life interest or a minority. I see. Okay. Our next question is, if a person doesn't have parents, spouse or children but has siblings, can they skip the siblings and name the nephews and nieces as beneficiaries? Gan? Uh, yes. If there is a will, uh, technically you can will your assets to anyone. But uh, yes, even let's say if there's a will, then of course you, you don't have to give to your siblings. Uh, you can give it to your nephews and nieces. But I think, I think this question may be related to the one on distribution act. Um, the distribution act doesn't talk about nephew and nieces. So if let's say uh, someone passed away uh, in that state, then um, let's say there's no more parents, spouse or children, then of course it goes to the sibling. Uh, the, the order has already been provided by the Act. But again, I, I repeat, if it's a will, then of course, you don't have, there is no order to follow. The Distribution Act doesn't uh, apply. So you just have, you can, you can basically will it to anybody. Okay then, uh, our next question. Uh, Priscilla, can Malaysia's will include an assets in Singapore? Yes, actually, um, your will can include assets from anywhere in the world. Um, not only in Singapore, so you can include your assets from Australia, UK. So what happens uh, after you have taken out a probate in Malaysia will be you need to approach um, foreign lawyers in the respective countries of your assets and apply um, to reseal the grant. However, that's only limited to Commonwealth countries. If it's not a Commonwealth country, you might need to um, apply for probate there. So it really depends on uh, where are your assets. So for this question, if the assets is in Singapore, um, you can reseal um, your probate obtained in Malaysia in Singapore. Right, just to add uh, to, again, to Priscilla's command, um, you can even prepare two wheels. So you can have one wheel for the assets in Malaysia and one wheel for your assets, uh, maybe in Singapore, yes. Yep, that can be done as well. Okay then, uh, we'll move on to our next question. What happens if a will cannot be found? So, Gun? yes, yeah. uh, let's say if a will cannot be found, um, I, I take a scenario that even the original will cannot be found or even a copy of the will cannot be found, then technically uh, too bad, you have to apply for the letters of administration and follow the distribution under the uh, distribution. distribution Act. Yes, under the Section 6 Distribution Act. But if subsequently it has been found, then you can apply to court um, to revoke the letters of administration and get the uh, probate out. I see. Okay then, uh, our next question. Will a beneficiary in a will who is already a bankrupt loses his right? And if so, how will the benefits be redistributed to existing beneficiaries? Uh, Priscilla, what are your thoughts? If the beneficiary is a bankrupt, his or her interests uh, will still be um, the bankrupt. So it doesn't matter whether the person is a bankrupt, he or she will still be entitled 
to the assets. Therefore, um, the, benefits, the benefits won't be redistributed to the existing beneficiaries in that sense. Um, however, one point on that is that if uh, the individual is bankrupt, the DGI might come in and um, the assets might go into DGI and settle the debts. I see. Okay, move on to our next question. Would testamentary trust in will protect the estate's assets against the deceased creditors? A gun? Uh, um, the answer would be uh, no. It's because, let's say, for example, um, there is a debt owing to the bank. Hence, uh, banks are usually uh, secure creditors. So, uh, the testamentary trust will not, uh, in a way, uh, protect the assets, uh, the, es uh, the estate assets. Uh, because if that, if that is the way, then everybody will start doing a testamentary trust and no one will pay the bank. Hence, uh, a short answer is uh, no, it wouldn't, we wouldn't. You still have to settle off your debts. Yes, that's the answer. Priscilla, um, our next question. Uh, I'm guessing... Okay. okay, after obtaining grant of LA, do we further apply for a distribution order to the beneficiaries before we can transfer the property at land office? Priscilla? Yes, um, so for a grant of LA situation, you will have to apply for a distribution order because it's provided under the Probate Administration Act I think it's section 60 sub 4, which says that um, an administrator cannot transfer any immobile property without first having an order of court. So therefore, you will need to apply for a distribution order before you can transfer the property at the land office. I see. Um, okay, I believe you have already answered this question. Can Malaysia will be used in Singapore? Uh, we answered that in our earlier question. Okay, next. Can a single parent assign the only child under 18 years old as the beneficiary without the risk of the ex-spouse fighting for it? Ganwa, your thoughts? Um, my answer is yes. You can actually um, give the properties to the only child under 18. But of course, uh, again, you have to satisfy the condition of having two executors. Um, since he's already an ex-spouse, then yes, there's no, no reason... Uh, and there is no basis even for the ex-spouse to actually come fighting for it. Gan, can I just add on that point? Um, if you have included in your will that um, the only child is the beneficiary, you can also add a clause to say that um, whoever that's not um, listed in the will will have no interest whatsoever. So that will further protect um, your assets against your ex-spouse. Yes. Okay. Our next question. Does Malaysia recognize a will made in Singapore on properties and cash in bank in Malaysia in the absence of a Malaysian will made in Malaysia? Uh, Priscilla? Yes, actually, um, Malaysia recognizes wills uh, made in Singapore. Uh, so for this scenario, what the individual should do is to apply to reseal the Singapore probate in Malaysia High Court. So that can be done and following that, the properties and cash in the banks can be um, distributed to the beneficiaries. Our next question. So if I'm a PR in Singapore and I did my will in Singapore, I would still need to settle the probate process in Singapore first as the answer given for question two. Uh, Gan? Um, yes, you can, if you have did your will in Singapore and you have a PR there, um, yes, you can apply your probate in Singapore first and then subsequently bring it over to Malaysia to actually reseal it. Again, uh, I stress the importance of domicile. Uh, where, the, where is your domicile? You could perhaps have a PR, but then you still hold the uh, Malaysian uh, citizenship. Then, of course, you can also still apply in Malaysia and then have it resealed in Singapore. So even where you actually prepared or made your will, uh, is, that is not the consideration. The, the whole consideration or what's the most important consideration here is where do you actually domicile? Okay then. Um, our next question. My wife and I jointly own a property in Malaysia. What should I do with or without a will to ensure that my wife will own the properties after my death? Priscilla? I think the best way is to write a will then your wife will definitely have the property after you pass away. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, because uh, we're running short on time, we will just take the next three questions. Okay. Okay. Can we leave out husband, uh, can we leave out wife or husband as a beneficiary in a will gun? All right, this is a very um, interesting, tricky, yes, tricky yet interesting question. Can, can you actually leave out your wife or husband as a beneficiary? Yes, you can. Definitely, you can do so. But uh, the caveat here is if the understanding uh, between the husband and wife is that uh, at the end of the day, you want to give everything to your children, then yes, you can do Then, of course, if there's already an understanding, then yes, that, that, that is okay to do so. But however, there are provisions, um, if I remember correctly, under the, the family, um, some family yeah. provisions, inheritance family provisions, if I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong, Priscilla, where um, if you leave up the wife, then of course, uh, the wife can subsequently go under that very particular uh, act to claim something uh, out of the estate if she is left out in the will. But I have not seen a, 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 a reverse position where the husband is left out, then then um, the wife can actually, um, yeah, then the husband can actually claim something. But it's usually the wife uh, who has been left out from the husband's will, then the wife can actually claim something. Um, Gan, just to add on that, um, it's provided under the Inheritance Family Provision Act. Yes, that's the act that I'm talking about. <laughs> I see. Okay, then. Our next question. What is the difference between a law firm and a will writing company? Priscilla? This is a tricky question. Um, for me, I would prefer my will to be prepared by a law firm because a law firm will have the expertise um, and the law firm will know uh, what should and should not be included at will and the consequences of having certain clauses and not having certain clauses in the will. So that's uh, my take on it, but I'm not going to comment on will writing companies. <laughs> Got anything to add? Yes, uh, I have something to add. So um, perhaps uh, why a law firm will be more appropriate. Uh, I'm not saying anything bad about the will writing companies. I'm, I'm sure they do have experienced uh, will writers also. That's, um, that's undeniable. But perhaps why law firms could be a better choice in a way is because they maybe litigators, they are in practice, they have experience and to know what are the issues that may come out or may go to court. And um, this experience, um, you may not find it in real writing companies because they are just a company, they don't go to court per se. Hence, um, um, this experience will be necessary and also uh, important in addressing uh, some of the issues that may be raised by clients. Hence, um, yeah, that, the difference is there, yes. That's my, that's my opinion. Okay, and our last question for today. Is the will on the asset made earlier still valid after the said asset has been transferred to someone later? Gan? It's no longer valid. So as long as, so even if in the will you have a particular asset, let's say asset A, but during your lifetime you have already, you have already sold the asset A to someone or even transferred it to someone else, so you can, the, benef the beneficiary cannot subsequently uh, upon death come and claim back or to claw back the asset A because the asset A has already been transferred. So, um, so whatever is in the, uh, in the will is, is no longer valid so long um, the testator has actually transferred it during his or her lifetime. Okay, um, and that's the end of our Q&A session. Thank you, Gun and Priscilla for your insights. Thank you, Suen. Yes, thank you, Suen. Before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. First, in addition to the personalized real writing package online, we would also like to introduce our employment law consultation retainer that was recently launched by our employment department. Our employment department offers consultation on a retainer basis to businesses and employer. This hassle-free retainer will give businesses and employer access to our qualified lawyers from the employment department by way of email, phone, or you can even set up an appointment for a face-to-face -face meeting at our office. Further information is available on our website, or you may scan this code that is available before you. Secondly, please join us again for our upcoming talks. This Wednesday, our partner, Ms. Christine To, will give an introduction to construction adjudication in Malaysia. This session will be conducted in Mandarin. 
Then on Friday, our partner, Juan Sara Kambali, and our associate, Ms. Anis Mohamed Sohaini, will give an introduction to FARA 8. Thirdly, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talk. The link to the form will be posted in the chat. We appreciate your comments so that we can continue to improve our MWKA online talk series for you in the future. Fourthly, please do follow or like our social media accounts. Next, if you'd like to speak with our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the telephone or over video conference. Please fill in the form on our website. The link is also posted in the chat box. To our guests, thank you for joining us. We hope you have found today's session informative and useful. Thank you, everybody. We hope to see you at our next talk. Stay safe and have a great day.